Judy, the room is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Lynn, thank you very much for coordinating this. Okay. And uh, um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I appreciate that introduction of, like that. Uh, of, of what I'm involved with. And I, I use closed captions. I have what's known as mildly severe hearing loss. I use two power hearing aids. So for those of you who may want to have captions, I use it as a backup. I Bluetooth to the computer. If you click on the CC at the bottom of your screen, you can call up the captions. Now you have to read captions. These are like robo captions on Zoom. Uh, they're called ASR, uh, automated, automated voice response. So when you introduced me and the caption, it came out that I was president of the Hearing Law Association. It's hearing loss. So just, you know, you, you could also use captions for your entertainment in some ways, you know, grain of salt kind of thing. Um, but thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Oh, my pleasure. And thank you. Um, I was telling Judy that she taught me something today because I've never enabled the closed captioning <clears throat> for a meeting before. And Judy emailed me and asked if I would, you know, we would be having closed captioning. And I said, and she asked if our tech team could set that up. And I thought, okay, I'll figure it out. And thank you, Zoom, who is very good at instructional videos. I went into Zoom. I typed in how to find closed captioning, and it was not difficult to do. So thanks to Judy, all of our programs will now be closed captioned moving forward. Thank you. Good. Um, and if you don't want closed captions, don't turn it on. But increasingly, you know, this is kind of a subtext. Increasingly, it used to be captions were for people who couldn't hear, which means older people like us, me. But now if you see kids, movies are captioned. You go into a sports bar, TVs are all captioned. I just saw an article the other day that young people want captions. It helps ESL, and this is a second language people. It, it's kind of a universal way to communicate for all kinds of reasons. Anyway, let me uh, get into things. I was going to say, if it works for everyone, what I'd like to do is kind of uh, uh, present some information. I understand we have about an hour. And then at the end of the program, uh, open it up for any and all questions, comments. The thing about hearing loss is it's not like eyeglasses. You can't get 20-20 hearing. So it's always unique to the individual. So I'm sure there'll be some questions, which I invite. If you have a pressing question in the moment, I suggest you go into chat and leave it there. But we'll have time at the end for everyone's questions. Does that work for everybody? Okay. Um, Lynn, could you flip on the PowerPoints if you would? And again, if you have hearing loss, the more multi-sensory the communication, the easier it is. Let me move my captions. If you do use the captions, if you click on the caption box, you can move it anywhere on your screen so it doesn't interfere. Can I move these myself, Lynn, or do I have to ask you? Either way is fine. I just don't know how to do it. I think you're probably best off asking me because I downloaded it okay. to upload. Okay, next. <laughs> Quick disclaimer. Um, you know, I'm trying to present a lot of ideas, opinions, and services without endorsing any particular one. Next. Why does hearing loss matter? Well, this is a quote from the National Academy of Sciences. I happened to attend the readout on this when I first retired six or seven, seven years, eight years ago now. Um, the he effects of hearing loss on communications and as a consequence, social interactions and functional abilities have serious public health implications for adults of all ages. Well, that means that not just I may have a hearing loss and may not be able to communicate with you, but what does that mean societally? And I guess I'll quickly share uh, what really motivates me, which I was mentioning earlier to Lynn. My dad back in the day uh, had hearing loss after he retired. His was, was genetic and age related, which isn't unusual. And he'd been a very gregarious outgoing guy. You know, he was an elected official. He was up, active in the community, the church, um, coached baseball. 
And back in the day, there wasn't the awareness of hearing loss. There was a stigma attached. And he was a fairly macho guy. And the technology, though, back in the day, were analog hearing aids, which meant you didn't even know when his battery was dead. You know, they just weren't so good. Um, in this day and age, with technology and awareness, there's absolutely no reason to, to have to, to withdraw. And what that happens societally is, you know, and we're getting more and more research about this, the tendency to become depressed, isolated, all kinds of health issues. Next slide. This is from AARP. Hearing loss can have a more negative impact on quality of life than obesity, diabetes, strokes, or even cancer. Who knew? Well, we don't know because, because it's not talked about, because you can bluff with hearing loss. You really can't bluff with obesity, diabetes, or, or cancer. Next slide, please. This is kind of the acid test. If you didn't know me and know what I was talking about, would you know I had hearing loss, actually moderately severe hearing loss? Probably not. How do how can others know if I have, if you have, if I or you have hearing loss? We have to self-identify. Um, but that means we have to kind of own it. We have to recognize that we have this this limitation. Uh, it's acknowledged by the Americans with Disabilities Act as a disability, by the way. We'll talk a little bit about what that means for venues. Um, and adapt to an improved quality of life. Um, I'm com very committed to using all the technology, and I'm not a technology person, but I've had to learn to use some of it. I possibly can. Otherwise, which I did for a long time before I retired, bluff. You know, there's a great, great line from Abraham Lincoln that I love as a person with hearing loss. Abraham Lincoln said, um, it's better to remain quiet and be thought of fool then speak up and remove all doubt. How many times, at least with me with hearing loss, did I bluff? I really didn't know what was going on, so I didn't say anything, or I said something inappropriate. Um, technology can help us with that in communication strategies. Please, Lynn, next. This is my story, as I briefly mentioned. Um, I've used hearing aids since for 40 plus years. I'm in my late 70s. My dad, you know, my dad was my example of how not to deal with hearing loss. Uh, I retired in 2016, decided not to bluff. I literally Googled hearing loss in D.C. and found the Hearing Loss Association of America. I got involved. I joined the board. It's now my second term as president. And then I was uh, involved with a joint program with Gallaudet, which I respect greatly, NHLAA, to train some people about consumer hearing technology. That doesn't mean we're going to give you a solution technologically, but it does mean we can help establish some criteria. And I also uh, teach a course called Hearing Matters uh, at OLLI at AU, which I've done for many years. So this, this hour together is kind of a, a highlight of that eight session course. So uh, am I talking too fast, too slow, too loud? How am I doing? Okay. I think Stop. you're doing great. Stop me if you want to. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Today, we're going to talk about how to recognize and evaluate hearing loss, um, something that took me a long time to personally do. How do we use critical communication strategies? For me, anyone further with, with, you know, latest in hearing aids, further than six feet away from me, not looking at me, I'm probably not going to hear. That's Everybody's going to have their rule of thumb about communication strategies. What do you do in a loud restaurant? Where do you sit in a meeting? These are all strategies you can implement if you are if you have hearing loss. And how do you adapt technologies? Uh, the latest thing, of course, is Bluetooth. The whole Internet of Things is really dramatically changing the, the hearing loss space. Uh, my hearing aids have Bluetooth, which means I can Bluetooth direct to my TV. I can also adjust it. It's programmable on my smartphone. If I want the sound totally coming from the TV or I want I want to have part surrounding and part TV, 
which means when I sit there watching Bluey, I don't know if you have grandkids, Bluey's big with grandkids. Uh, I can also have this sidebar conversation with my with my toddler grandson. So the technology available to us is pretty significant. And then the Americans with Disabilities Act. Hearing loss is a disability. When we go into a, a government organization, agency, a large venue, there are certain obligations to provide accommodations. And we'll talk about that briefly. Next, please, Lynn. This is kind of a quick checklist. I won't read these, but take a look. And if you check off the box on a few, you might, you know, you might want to think about seeing an audiologist for a, for a checkup. I remember in a class one time, this lovely lady, we're looking at this list, and she said, no, 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 no. Everybody else mumbles. I'm fine. Well, maybe not. Okay, need more time with this list? To check off more than a few, think about it, because it's easy to bluff with hearing loss. It's not like a mobility disability where you need a wheelchair and a ramp, uh, or uh, you know, if, if you have vision impairment where you need a, a cane and, and certain glasses. Unless you tell people, nobody knows. Next, please. If you do have hearing loss, you're not alone. And here are the kind of sobering statistics. I shouldn't use that word at a happy hour program, right? <laughs> Forget that word. The statistics about hearing loss, you're not alone. 25% um, of seniors in their 60s, 50% in their 70s, that's me, 80% in their 80s have functionally severe hearing loss. That's a lot of us. And stigma and stepping up to it is, is a big issue. And 20% of teenagers, I was surprised by this number, but you can't walk down the street these days. I live near American University and not see kids with stuff in their ears. So it's logical. Next, please. 48 million Americans have hearing loss. It's the third most prevalent health issue. It's associated, and this is, I think, what matters to those of us in our senior years. It is associated with increased risk of dementia, falls, and depression. We don't want these as we age, if we can, if we can mitigate that. Uh, this is another kind of startling statistic. On average, hearing aid users wait seven to 10 years, seven to 10 years, after the initial diagnosis before being fitted for hearing aids. Now, we often find there's a couple of reasons. One is stigma, you know, and this, this is in days of old, it's not today. If something's in my ears, I must be old, not the way it is today. The other one is cost. You know, hearing aids from an audiologist can be expensive. However, there is research done in the UK where they pay for all your health needs, including hearing aids. That number didn't change. People still waited much longer than they could or should have to get hearing aids. 80% of people who benefit from hearing aids do not use them. And that's from the World Health Organization. So that's globally. And 50 million Americans experience tinnitus who have hearing loss. Tinnitus is when you hear noises. I have it. Most people with hearing loss do. When you hear noises that are not external, you know, we hear with our brain. So you're hearing things that don't exist externally. It's just the way the ear functions. Okay, next please. If you if you if you're seeing yourself, you know, having some functional hearing loss, these are probably the steps you should consider taking. You start with your primary care doctor. Oftentimes they don't do a hearing test, which is why you need to educate yourself. And then if it's seeing an ENT, I recently had sinusitis. And I, I saw my primary, went to the ENT uh, to be sure it's not structural. Not he all hearing loss can be remediated, can be fixed with corrected, made better with hearing aids. There can be all kinds of other issues, aphasia, um, the conduction issues. Uh, but if the, ENT, you know, if the ENT clears you, then you need to see an audiologist. And a doctorate in audiologist in AUD is the best criteria for choosing an audiologist. 
The audiologist will do what's called an audiogram. Anybody here have had an audiogram? Couple people. I I I, I had audiograms for decades. Never knew what it meant, <laughs> um, except every time my hearing was a little worse, and I pay a lot of money for a new hearing aid. The audiogram is really the 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 assessment that tells you where you have hearing loss and the sounds you're probably having difficulty with. That audiogram then drives work in collaboration with your audiologist who should be patient focused. What kind of recommendations are made for hearing aids? What kind of assistive devices you might wanna consider? You can buy all this stuff, but if it doesn't meet your hearing needs, according to the audiogram, doesn't make much sense. And we're lucky in an urban area, uh, we have audiologists. Uh, Gallaudet has wonderful audiologists. I, I can't make recommendations, but uh, GW has an audiology department, Johns Hopkins, University of Maryland. There are lots of good ones. Then more rural areas, they often will have what's called a hearing instrument, instrument specialist. That's not a doctorate in audiology, but it's someone who can, who can uh, dispense, which is the word, hearing aids. Some retail establishments also will have hearing instrument specialists. That's different than an audiologist. Next. What does the audiologist do? Well, they can identify at a granular level what kind of hearing loss you have to recommend solutions. They should be able to provide multiple hearing aid manufacturers. Increasingly, what we're seeing, there are kind of five major uh, hearing aid manufacturers in the hearing space. Increasingly, not all, but some of those manufacturers are doing vertical integration. So when you go to the, the, the uh, audiologist, they're gonna sell that line of hearing aids. And one line of hearing aids may have two or three different brands, not what you want. You want an audiologist who's gonna provide an array of hearing aids so they can work with you to get the best solution for you. Recently, as an outcome of that uh, study done by the uh, um, uh, I forget what they're called, National Academy, uh, the FDA in 2022 approved what are called over-the-counter hearing aids. Over-the-counter hearing aids are FDA approved. Not all are, you know, buyer beware. Over-the-counter hearing aids uh, you can now buy in some big box retail stores. Uh, you can buy them online. For some people, they're just fine. And they probably cost hundreds or low thousands instead of mid-high thousands, which, you know, uh, audiology uh, prescribed hearing aids would cost. Because with the audiologist, you're getting service. It's a bundled package. You're not just buying the product, the hearing aids. You're buying service. I probably see my audiologist two or three times a year for various adjustments. But over-the-counter hearing aids now are a much more economically accessible option. What you don't get with over-the-counter hearing aids is someone to hold your hand. Um, you know, someone to, to help fit them. Someone if you have a problem to go to. So if you get an over-the-counter hearing aid, the caveat is, 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 is kind of, do you, are you able to do that kind of thing for yourself? Um, and always know what the return policy and what the warranty policy is when you buy any of these things, right? over-the-counter audiologist dispensed hearing aids. Know, know what protection you're getting. With over-the-counter hearing aids, we, we don't lobby, we advocate. We advocated strenuously that the box it comes in have clear information about the warranty and the return policy. It's kind of the Wild West with some of the over-the-counter stuff. Next one. Today, unlike in my dad's time where it was analog, everything is digital. So what does a hearing aid do? Basically, it has a microphone. So I'm getting sound from my computer. It has an amplifier and it has a speaker to the, you know, going to your ear. The benefit of Bluetooth is you don't, you don't have all the uh, noise in between. It's a direct link. When you do get hearing aids, what you wanna consider and not all hearing aids come with this, but what things to consider if you need it. If you, oh, what I didn't say, which is very important, 
over-the-counter hearing aids are only for those with mild to moderate hearing loss. And moderate is kind of low moderate. They're, they're, they're not going to have the programming options that someone with moderate to severe or profound hearing loss would have. So you want to get a T-coil. A T-coil is short for telephone coil. Back in the day when, when we were on our phones, hearing aids and phones, there'd be a buzzing. You really couldn't hear anything. So a lot of work was done to establish ratings for mobile phones to have a T-coil. I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, if you walk into a classroom at Ali at AU, for example, there'll be a picture on the wall of an ear and a big T. That means that room is looped. If it's looped, it means if you flip on your T-coil switch, you'll have a direct link to the mic. And the first criteria for hearing effectively is the, is the sound source. If you have a mumbler on the mic, it's not gonna be easy to hear. So the sound source matters. But assuming you have someone who's fairly articulate uh, with a T-coil, now more recently, instead of a switch, and this is an interesting story, my uh, hearing aids before this, I told the audiologist, I'd like to keep it simple, please. You know, I, you know, the old hearing aids, you'd push once up and down three times. It got very complicated to be fussing with the real estate behind your ear. So she did that. And what I realized is she had not activated my T-coil. Yes, I had a T-coil, but the audiologist needs to activate your T-coil. More recently with smartphones, um, it, it, it's, all, it's all on an app. So you just, you know, open up your app, go to, am I watching TV? Am I, uh, do I need my T-coil? Uh, whatever I need. And, and, it, and, it, and the program will come up. Noise reduction. This is really invaluable for those of us who want to socialize. If I go to a restaurant, if I go to a meeting, I don't want to hear all the ancillary noises. So I can, I can set a program. I can set a program for directional bikes. Do I want to speak to the person immediately in front of me, or do I want to have an array of people who are coming into my in, 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 into my hearing capability? And Bluetooth. Bluetooth has been out for a handful of years, and if you're getting hearing aids, I highly recommend Bluetooth. It's been a real game changer for me. Variable programming. I just kind of gave some examples of that with 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 newer hearing aids, and, and to synchronize your hearing aids. If like me, you have two, we used to have to have to separately sync them. Now you don't. Or we haven't talked about cochlear implants. If you have profound hearing loss, you're probably going to be a candidate for cochlear implants, where there's, you know, there's a surgical procedure, you have a magnet, and you bypass the cochlea. Because again, we don't hear through our ears, we hear through our brain. And if you, I know a lot of people have one hearing aid, one cochlear implant. You want those to, to sync. Uh, so these are things you just kind of want to look for. Next. I better talk. Hearing devices. Um, once you understand your hearing loss from the audiogram, you know, there's all kinds of things you can purchase, but the audiogram should drive what's most appropriate for you. Uh, personal sound amplifiers called PSAPs. I mentioned these because those are the things you see advertised uh, in the Sunday supplements or in some magazines. All those do is amplify sound. If that's all you need, great. But that's seldom what most people need. Usually you need a way to, to little, be a little more um, targeted about what, what you want to be hearing. Captions. We talked a little bit about captions this evening. I use captions more and more and more because they're universal. You know, if I'm in an environment, uh, do I know if they have Bluetooth? Do they know what kind of uh, sound system they have? Uh, captions are, are, are becoming quite universal. Skype, if you all Skype, I was Skyping with a friend the other day in Europe. Captions are now available. A lot of these caption availabilities are post-pandemic. Zoom, two or three years ago, did not offer free captions. And we had petitions and we advocated that it is an accessibility requirement. Now there's free captions. Um, if, you, if you need a voice to text, I use these with doctors especially, many of whom are English as a second language. 
but I'll use my voice to text. And I, I always preface it by saying, this has nothing to do with HIPAA. It's just to help me understand you and all the terminology. But if you have a, a smartphone, this app, NAL Scribe, it's National, it's the Aus National Australian Labs out of Australia, is a really good voice to text app. Easy to use. It's only been out a few months. Easy to use. You can keep a, um, a, tran uh, a transcription if you choose. I highly recommend that. And telecommunications. <clears throat> if you have hearing loss and you can hear on the phone, ignore what I have to say for the next the next bullet. But if like me, when I first retired, and I was dealing with all these insurance companies and social security and all this stuff. I wanted to make sure I got their numbers right. So I got a caption telephone. The caption telephone, uh, you can you can Google CapTel. It is free. You have to self-certify that you have a hearing loss and it is free. They will deliver it to you. Uh, and it's it's really easy to use. It's a large screen with push buttons, you know, and, and push screens. So for someone like me, it's pretty idiot proof. And that will caption the other person. Now, the captioning, you can have a choice of do you want a person? And they are, um, you know, certified to not share any information. Or do you want a robo? Uh, I find sometimes a robo can actually be, be um, more useful. But again, these are options. And if if you don't have, the landline does require an internet connection. Uh, so I use it only at my desk when I know I'm gonna to have to be going through a lot of numbers or very detailed stuff. On my mobile phone, there is a service called Inno caption, the bottom line on this on, on the PowerPoint. Inno caption, again, if you Google it, uh, is free. You have to self-certify again that you're hard of hearing. You can use your same mobile number and you can receive calls that are captioned and you can send calls that are captioned. Increasingly, I use this because increasingly we're all we're all more mobile. Um, that didn't exist before COVID. Uh, you had to have a special phone number. It got very complicated. I never really used it. Uh, but that, that's now available free. You just have to check it out and ask. Next. One thing we sometimes don't think about uh, if we're hard of hearing is safety. And, you know, I my, my personal bias is, you know, cover the safety issues and don't worry about it. Live my life. So research has shown that half of those with mild, only mild to severe hearing loss will not wake up with a standard alarm. That kind of, that's kind of scary. Um, so what do we do? Well, you can use flashing lights. When I used to travel with my work, I used to stay at Marriott and they had my profile and they'd always assign me a room as I requested, where if my telephone was ringing, if someone were at my door, and I had my hearing aids on, I wasn't going to hear it probably, the lights would, there'd be a blinking light. If there was a fire alarm, you know, auditorily, I might not, I probably would, but I might not blinking lights. Um, most hotels, because of the American Disabilities Act, have to provide X number of, of rooms and or X number of equipment for those with hearing loss for purposes of safety. Um, and then there's there's auditory where you can, uh, you, you know, it's like having different tones on your phone. You can have different sounds for different issues. Then there's tactile, haptic. So if something, if something, um, if there's something happening, uh, I think I think of one device particularly called a bed shaker. A bed shaker. You're shaking your head. You know, bed shakers. I use it with my teenage son. I never used it myself, but it's great for a teenage boys. He's now a dad himself, but back in the day. And you put this in your bed and, it, you know, if something happens or you simply want to wake up and you can't hear an alarm, you start shaking your bed. And the more you don't get up, the more it shakes. It gets to a point where you, you really want to get out of bed. Um, uh, the other thing, and this is not a... How should I say this? I personally have greatly benefited from an Apple Watch, an iWatch. I don't know. Don't, this is not an endorsement. This is a personal testimony, but it, it has haptic. So I live in a townhouse and I have uh, 
uh, what's that thing called where you see people at your door? Um, can't think of the name. A ring doorbell. What's the name? A ring doorbell. The ring, the doorbell. Ring, ring, right. Thank you very much. So if I'm like now I'm in the basement in my office. If someone comes to my front door, I might not hear them anyway, but it, it, it shows up on my watch that someone's ringing at my door. It's a haptic. It doesn't have to ring. I can feel it. Um, I have found that to be really, really helpful. Also with falls, there is a tendency. Two weeks ago, you would have seen me with a black eye. I took a tumble in my kitchen. I stupidly was in socks. I should have had, you know, I should have had uh, uh, slippers on, but I didn't. Anyway, there is a tendency with hearing loss to fall. Why? Because you're you're distracted. You know, can you walk down the street and have a conversation with someone walking next to you if you have hearing loss? Maybe not, because you want to look at them to have eye contact and talk, but you have so you can be sure to hear them, but you have to focus on on where you're going. So this 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 watch has an ability, if I fall, to notify DCEM. EMS and my son, who's my designated contact. If I don't respond in 60 seconds, I, my tumble was not a big deal. So I pushed, yes, I fell, but I'm okay. So no one came to my door, but it's, it's pretty useful. And it does all kinds of other things as well. Um, next slide, please. Okay, the Americans with Disabilities Act, if we're willing to say we have a disability, which I was not for a very long time, um, champions human rights things by declaring that people with disabilities are an integral part of society and as such should not be segregated, isolated, or subjected to the effects of discrimination. The ADA is about enabling people with disabilities to take charge of their lives and join the American mainstream. Passed 30, 40 years ago by uh, President Bush. And it keeps being added to, particularly in the hearing space because of technology and the internet of things. This is not static, the protections that are available to us. But you know, when you, when you look at the scheme of things around disabilities, Mobility is visible, right? You know, someone has a mobility disability because they're probably in a wheelchair or a cane uh, or a walker. If someone is is blind, you probably know because they may have a cane or they may have special glasses. Um, if someone is deaf, you probably know because they're probably using American Sign Language, which I don't know. <coughs> Lynn was telling me she knows that, which I admire. I don't have the dexterity, you know, and my my uh, the people with whom I communicate don't don't have, use ASL either. But if you're hard of hearing, again, you have to self-identify. Um, a quick quick story about Americans with Disabilities Act. I love books. I don't know if any of you love books. And uh, before the pandemic. It goes way back to days on the National Mall under the Bush administration. Barbara Bush started the National Book Festival affiliated with the Library of Congress. And I used to love going to that, whether it was muddy in the tents or not. And then they moved it to the D.C. Convention Center, which accommodated more people in, in, in ostensibly a better environment. Well, when I would attend that, along with another member of our board, you know, we started comparing notes because if, if, you, if you're familiar with the National Book Festival, they have seven or eight stages where an author will talk about their books. And the main stage would have thousands of people. The other ones may have hundreds. And there, there's just all kinds of events going on. Well, all the stages had an American Sign Language interpreter, which the vast majority of people who are hard of hearing don't know American Sign Language. So we got in conversations, but what, 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 what the convention center did have for the National Book Festival is a system called uh, an FM system, which means they had transmitters on the ceiling. Well, the ceiling was stories high and it, you know, there's like thousands of people. And when you arrived, you get to this station and you picked up this, uh, 
of this device that the transmitter was supposed to communicate with your hearing aid. Well, for me and, and this other fellow on the board, it just didn't work. So we were in conversation with those people for, because it was only an annual, it took three years before they agreed to provide captions. Now, you know, captions, if you're, if you're deaf and you use American Sign Language, you can be assigned to sit up front where the caption is wise. The first time I went to one of these uh, book festivals at the convention center, the first thing, the first, everybody thinks if you're hard of hearing, you're deaf, which I'm not. They assigned me to sit up front. Well, the good news was, you know, I was 10 feet away from this eminent author, which is great. But the bad news was I didn't quite know what she was saying. With captions, what they're able to do now is transmit the captions to your mobile phone wherever you're seated, as well as having them up front. Now, why do I mention ADA? Yes, this is a right. The reality was the convention center is operated by a quasi DC governmental agency called Monumental something. And the um, hearing assistive devices were subcontracted to a company. <laughs> and of course the Library of Congress reports to Congress and not a DC government agency. So when you really try to get the accommodation that should be provided, it can get pretty crazy sometimes. But, you know, it took a while, but it now has captions. And there was the pandemic, and I think the Library of Congress has now moved pretty much to uh, online platforms. But you have to know what you need and how to talk to the venue about what you need, because we need to be accommodated. Next. <laughs> Hearing assistive devices, what we talked about so far, hearing aids, cochlear implants, uh, smartphones, uh, Bluetooth, uh, microphones, all those things are things that you, you would get for yourself to use. How do those work in tandem with large venues, the National Book Festival, uh, attending a Nationals ball game, uh, the Kennedy Center, uh, I go to National Presbyterian Church, it's 1,500 people. How do those work together? Well, you know, you put me six feet away from anyone and I can understand what they're saying. You put me in a large venue and unless there's some accommodating technology, I may not understand what's going on. Um, so what are the barriers, noise? You know, if you're going to the theater, you know what you want to hear. You want to hear the performers but there are all these other acoustical things going on, reverberation. When you go to a restaurant, I highly recommend you go to what I call an old world restaurant, thick carpet, thick draperies, tablecloths, tables far apart, because you don't get all the sound you do vibrating off the, the newest trend in restaurants, which is this uh, high tech, industrial look, everything's open, you know, there's nothing absorbing the sound to help you hear. In distance, sound loses energy. The further sound has to go, the less it's able to be understood. Next. Um, the whole concept of a large venue is catch and carry. The talker, the desired sound, the sound source is captured by a mic of some kind or another. It can be all kinds of ways to do that. The mic changes the signal to an electrical signal, sends it to a transmitter, then it broadcasts across the room to a receiver worn by the listener. Uh, or if you have uh, T-coils, it can go directly to your T-coil. I don't want to get into the technology. I'm not an engineer. I don't really understand it all. But if you're going to be going to the theater, particularly, you know, be aware of what they, the sound system they have, what they offer. Some don't go through poles, some will go through walls. So, you know, where you sit and what kind of system they have and what kind of, what you need to ask for becomes incumbent upon you. Kennedy Center is wonderful. Uh, we've worked training some of their volunteers. They do a really, really good job of accommodation. Next. So there's, there's a system called an induction loop. <laughs> some, some libraries have it in DC, we work to get Oh, I don't know, six or eight libraries in D.C., which means you have a T-coil. Our meetings, our HLA chapter meetings are often held when we're live in the Tenley Library, 
which which has this. I don't know in the in, in the Georgetown area what if any libraries might be looped. Um, frequent FM system. The church I attend has an FM system, which means the sound goes through walls. Now you wouldn't want that at a place where you have like the National Book Festival or you have adjacent meeting rooms. If I'm late for a service, I can I can and I have to wait to be seated. I can still hear them because it goes through the walls. <laughs> There we go. Uh, Kennedy Center uses an infrared system, which can be very useful, except it doesn't go, it does not go through like columns. So you have to know where you're going to be seated. Next. And this all comes down to advocacy. You know, um, if we if we want accommodations, you really have to advocate for ourselves. These things don't happen without advocacy. I've learned that firsthand in my time with. HLAA. You wouldn't have captions. You wouldn't have, uh, you know, uh, captions at the, the National Book Festival at a bunch of venues. We don't advocate. You wouldn't have, when I first started advocating, DC Council didn't have accommodations. Well, now they do. Um, as Sherry Ebert says, and she has a blog, by the way, if you want to Google her, she's a very good blog. Living with hearing loss requires knowledge, practice, and a healthy attitude. Your role in advocating for what you need is key, which means you have to say, yeah, I have a hearing loss. That was very hard for me to do. My dad never really wanted to do that. In public venues, familiarize yourself with what access is offered. And if it's not accommodating, if it doesn't work, continue to advocate. Um, in the past, established two years ago now, was the mayor's office on deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing. We advocated for three years along with the deaf and deafblind communities to get this established because we're not a monolith. Each of those communities have different needs. The mayor was against it. Council finally passed it. The Hill passed it. Of course, if they don't do anything for 60 days, it passes, which is what happened. So that agency is now in operation as, as a resource to contact. And if you can't resolve accessibility, DC has an Office of Disability Rights. You can contact them. Now, when I retired and I Googled, by the way, the Office of Disability Rights in DC didn't even have a bullet on their website for hard of hearing. It was all visual, you know, mobility and, uh, and deaf accessibility. That's changed. Now we have a whole office of deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing. And of course, the organization that I'm affiliated with, the Hearing Loss Association, is a wonderful resource. And uh, we have uh, generally monthly meetings with all kinds of prominent speakers. Everyone's invited free of charge. Next. Thank you. I think we have 10 or 15 minutes left. I appreciate your attention. Uh, questions, comments? I'm open. Thank you very much, Lynn. Well, thank you very much. You certainly gave us a lot of information. Um, I'm going to take the, uh, I guess, the Zoom host prerogative with the first question here. Um, your PowerPoint is fabulous. It shares a lot of great information. Are you okay if we keep the PowerPoint and share that with our members? Sure. I certainly, I mean, it'll have the title, uh, title slide. You'll have attribution. I just feel like it's something that somebody may want to refer to. My goal is to spread the word, so happy to do it. Thank you for right. asking. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, and now, anybody else can ask a question. Thank you. And please remember to unmute before you ask your question, because I've muted everybody for the discussion. Carol? Uh, yes, thank you so much for your presentation and time. I serve on the Georgetown Village Board. Like so many people, uh, especially, I think, in this country where, you know, nobody really wants to get old here and be venerated for being old, right? Everybody wants to stay young. You know, if it's an issue for you as you age, it's harder for people to acknowledge that and figure out, or hard, and figure out the point at which they should do something about it. I think that your remarks certainly touched on this, but do you have any thoughts on 
for people who have hearing loss as part of the normal aging process, how they recognize and address it um, before it becomes a detriment to their lifestyle. I had one friend who shall remain nameless who finally got her husband in his mid to late 80s to start wearing a hearing aid and their life was fundamentally changed because he, they could talk, go for dinner and you know he could go to the shows and actually hear things and he was less isolated, but he resisted it for the longest time. So any thoughts you have on any of that would be most useful to know. You know, your your story is is uh, one I I hear often. Um, I think I think that oftentimes a a family member or a friend is the one who says, "Gee, you know, I think you've asked me to repeat that multiple times. Maybe we should get your hearing checked." It's you know, it's kind of like the you know that that old uh, adage about the frog in boiling water. People become people become immune to the dramatic change that ultimately is happening. Um, often, what I hear most often is a friend, a family member uh, attending a presentation like this will spur someone to just see an audiologist. If they check off any of those indicators about hearing loss, then they probably should get their hearing checked. If for no other reason than establish a baseline. Because as we age, it's probably not going to get better. Now, uh, aging is not the only reason for hearing loss, by the way. There are lots of people. I had lost hearing in this year after my uh, my son's birth. No one knew why. Uh, I had a friend who was on an airplane coming back from Europe. Pressure changed. They lost hearing. So it, it can be an incident-related thing. But the demographics suggest, as I shared with you, like many things as we age, you know, hearing loss increases it sounds an oxymoron to say loss increases but you know what i'm you know what i mean I um uh so thank you for sharing that but it oftentimes takes someone else to encourage the person now as far as getting getting an, a hearing test with an audiologist uh if we're of an age where we're on uh, uh medicare or some insurance companies will pay for a hearing test. I'm on Medicare. I can get an annual hearing test. Now, if my hearing test says I need a hearing aid, zero dollars. <laughs> now, that's kind of strange. If I need a cochlear implant, Medicare will pay for that. Go figure. But at any age, it's good to get a baseline. And it's also good to know you know, if if you're if you're if you're withdrawing, if you're isolating, um, I saw that with my dad. You know, it, it, it's it's physically and mentally unhealthy. Uh, yes, it is, and thank you so much for being the. How did how did how did your how did your anonymous friend finally decide to to get their hearing tested? I think that uh, the husband decided after hearing from the wife for an extended period of time that he had best get his hearing checked or he was going to have more significant problems at home. And it really made a huge difference in their lifestyle. I can think of one other person who shall remain nameless where I live that some people have just given up even trying to talk to this person because you're yelling and yeah. screaming and you can't be heard and it can become exhausting. And it's just so sad because it's a really smart, uh, successful government retiree. And uh, we, we try to communicate, but it's, it's just so hard. Some people have given up. Well, you know, hearing loss does not discriminate. Right. I, 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 you know, the people in this Ali class, the people as I do presentations, uh, in our demographic, particularly here in D.C., very bright, talented, contributing people. And, you know, who wants to spend 20 percent of your life not being able to be part of to socialize and be part of that communication infrastructure? But the first step is, you know, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many people, you know, they, they first got a, an audiogram because a, a, a child, an aunt, an uncle, a spouse, would say, turn down the bleeping TV, <laughs> you know, 
I mean, the triggers are going to be different, but the action step is the same. Please see an audiologist, get a baseline. Sometimes you don't need hearing aids. Sometimes hearing aids might help. Well, and, and I don't want to monopolize. Other people may have questions, but I do teach as adjunct at GW University in the public health school. And to your point, uh, almost every class I have at least one or two students who have um, problems with hearing and they're in their 20s and 30s. So we use the assistive devices and we also are on Zoom and they open up captioning for themselves, which they can do. Yeah, increasingly, you know, because younger people are using all kinds of devices in, in this in this uh, real estate we call ears, um, it, it, it's acceptable. I mean, I don't think young people think much about putting something in their ears. Uh, you know, it's it's a stigma that we of a different generation have about it. Can I make a comment about that? Sure. Absolutely. Sure. Uh, I probably got hearing aids 15 years ago, something like that. And so I've had hearing aids for a very long time. The problem still persists. You know, the hearing aids do not solve everything. But just recently, uh, you know, it's just gotten worse. And my husband now, so we have this household where hearing is a problem. Okay. So for Christmas, I said, okay, I, I can't use, everybody said, oh, use the little buds. Well, if you use buds, you have to take your hearing aids out. And so my kids gave me these for Christmas and they're fabulous. I use them all the time. I walk around the streets because you're absolutely right. Nobody cares. People walk around with all kinds of things hanging out of ears and so on. But the other two things that were real lifesavers, we got a new telephone. I apologize because I got uh, delayed and so I uh, missed part of the beginning. And if you've said this already, I apologize for repeating it. But um, no, no, we no. got a new a new telephone system for hearing impaired people, which has been fabulous. And then the other thing was the television set is a problem. We, you know, the television microphones are apparently universally bad. And there are now these devices and we got one that boosts the volume uh, or not even the volume, the quality of the spoken word. And it has been fabulous. So, uh, add that to your, you know, your comments about things you can do that will increase. Right. Thank you. I absolutely will. May I ask you a question? You, sure. you, you spoke about uh, earbuds, earpods. I said people said get earbuds, those little, you know, Apple earbuds. Oh, okay. Do do but, you use those? No, I, I, I use this. I didn't understand. Yeah. Okay. That's no, what I was because the understand. earbuds you have to take out your hearing aids and then put the buds in, and that doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this that, is that's, fine. That that's what I wanted to clarify. Yeah. Apple is actually I read this a couple of weeks ago coming out with ear. I don't know if they call it. Yeah, I guess they call it ear pods. I don't use them for exactly the reasons you're you're saying. I don't want to take out my hearing aids and I can't hear with them. But they're right. going to have some kind of hearing hearing supplement for those with mild hearing loss. Now that I don't know enough to talk more about it. Um, you know, and, and you mentioned being at, at uh, in uh, environments with family members. What I've had to do when when you when you're hard of hearing, it's exhausting to try to hear. And I've had that conversation with family members and they 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 listen up for 60 seconds. I love them, they love me, but then they're off doing their thing. So when I have a gathering with family and I love to be with family, I need I honestly make an effort to say, okay, for someone I don't know, I have hearing loss. I'd like to get to know you. Let's go into another room. Let's go into the den. Let's sit by the fireplace and have a conversation. Because with all this yada yada, I'm not going to be able to hear you. So I also give myself space sometimes to just go for a walk. You know, I mean, everyone, everyone wants to catch up and everyone's talking and no one's talking to me. And I'll just excuse myself. I mean, I think I think that's how I've emotionally found ways to um, not get so wiped out, not get so tired about everything. But thank you very much for sharing that, and I will definitely add that to my to my uh, what what am I do presentations. The other thing I'd mention to you, Claire, is have you do you have Bluetooth in your hearing aids? You know, I hate Bluetooth. I resisted getting it. My husband does, and I hate what it does, so I won't do it. I really don't want that. Oh, okay. Personal preference. 
but but for me, it, it's it's been a game change, especially with TV, because if I'm alone, I can set it direct to the TV, and I can even hear the BBC, which oftentimes is a challenge for whatever reason. Um, and if my grandson's around, I can set it so I can hear equally the TV and surrounding, so we can have an, a, a conversation. But you know, I, everyone has different preferences. Again, it's not like eyeglasses. If you don't go get a 2020, they're going to work for me and for you. Yeah. And and the other thing I think, and you you alluded to this, you I'm never going to hear the way I heard before I had hearing loss, and I just have to live with that. That's but I right. try to make it as good as I can so that I am not isolated. That's right. I think you probably point. share that. That's absolutely wanted, true. I also wanted to share that we have had some members um, who did get their hearing aid from a big box store, from um, Costco or someplace like that, and they've gotten great service. Yeah. So um, just for you to know, uh, although it is a big box store and not an audiologist, you can, you know, if you find the right person to help you, you can also get assistance. At, at, and as you mentioned, it's, you know, much, much less expensive. But I think Costco actually does have audiologists. I know I have a friend who got his from Costco and he said the audiologist there is just fabulous. So I don't, I think at least some Costco's actually have an audiologist. And ah. the, it was, it's very, again, it's, said it was great, great, great service. And they also have young people to show you how to use the technology on your phone. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, I've had a lot of pros and cons about Costco. Um, you, you, research has indicated that uh, over 80% of the people who originally go to Costco, free hearing exam, and they do offer... Uh, and, and many in our area, I think we tend to have audiologists at Costco's, not true of all Costco's, but 80 percent of people don't go back again because, yeah. you know, unless the store is willing to service you real time. Like if my if I have a problem with my hearing aids, I want to see my audiologist in a couple of days and be operable again. That may not be the case in a retail I environment. On the other hand, uh, I've had many, many people who are very satisfied with Costco. So it, again, it depends. I think, at, at, as you said, Lynn, who 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 are you working with? The other thing about Costco is they do not they do not uh, merchandise the latest iterations. They 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 have uh, a limited. Uh, if you if your hearing loss is mild, moderate, Costco probably would serve your needs. They have a limited supply of of uh, manufacturers. And they also are just talking to someone the other day who was quite frustrated. They they lock, and I've never gone to Costco, so I'm speaking third hand here. They lock hearing aids. So you can't go to any audiologist to get them serviced. Ah. I see you shaking your head. Have you had experience with that? Juanita? Yeah, no, I just I had an aunt who went there and originally they do have an audiologist on site at the Costco location in Arlington, Virginia, but she needed to get it service and they don't have a service program to go back oh. and get anything adjusted or anything of that sort. She still had to go back to MedStar, make an appointment with an audiologist oh. to have them service and they were locked. So she had to go back to Costco, get them unlocked. Yeah. And, and sometimes, depending on where you go, there may be a fee associated with them unlocking them so an audiologist can um, service them. Thank you. I don't have firsthand, but your, your, uh, your experience resonates with what I've heard from a number of people. Interesting. Um, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know I promised you an hour. Are there any other questions? I just wondered a uh, couple of things. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Hear. Okay. Uh, first of all, I just wondered uh, that fee at Costco, like where Varnita said there may be a fee to unlock the uh, whatever it is. Um, I just wonder, are we talking five or ten dollars? Are we talking five hundred dollars? I don't know. Yeah. I have no idea. Oh, okay. I, I I don't know. You're but when you Costco but then. but but I would say the fee you pay an audiologist. Uh, you know, a doctor on audiology in a, in a practice 
is bundled and it's going to cost more because you're going to get that service included. Usually the warranty mm -hmm. is three years or so. That's so it's a bundled service. For well, if you go to an audiologist rather than Costco. Correct. So okay. you're, 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 does that okay? You had another yeah. question? I, the other question is, could somebody please tell me what earbuds are for? <laughs> I don't use them. Anybody here use earbuds? I can answer that good question. Well, I mean, what Thank you. Do, I, I can answer the question. Yes. I, I don't use Apple products, but I can answer the question. What earbuds do is that they will connect to your phone. Um, it's a way, you know, to be able to hear from, uh, mm -hmm. what's on your phone better if you're listening to music or talking on the phone. And they fit into your ear as opposed to what Claire is wearing, which is on the outside. So oh, that's okay. really the big difference, and that's what an earbud does. Oh, thank you. You thank you. the 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 major providers of those are Apple and Bose. And if you're going to look into those, make sure you get a a, a kind of a a recognized brand. There's a lot of vendors coming and going in that space. Now, the other thing to your question, uh, Jacqueline, is what's happening now is this whole category called hearables which is pretty cool. And they're they're being driven often by earbuds, again, for a different generation without nothing of putting things in their ears. Hearables now often have the capability of doing everything that my iWatch does. So I can have <laughs> 2,000 songs. If I touch my cheek, it's going to play rhythm and uh, it's going to play jazz. If I touch my nose, it's going to play uh, whatever. Uh, I can get, I can get my, my, uh, my, count my steps. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, the space is just pretty, pretty incredible. Well, However, we're talking today at another meeting, you know, technology is just uh, amazing and it's all over the place. Pat, um, if you have a question, do you want to unmute? Well, one second. I think we need to unmute. Uh, genetic, uh, it, family, my father, as far as I, uh, I remember forever that he could never hear. He was one of the first people um, to start with um, some surgery. And unfortunately, he was the only person that didn't didn't work. He always had trouble with the hearing aid. My brother had trouble with the hearing aid. My sister had trouble with the hearing aid. They could never use them. And I'm very nervous about, you know, I'm... On the chain, on the bottom of the chain of this with throughout the family. And I'm really scared, scared to put out several thousand dollars. And for example, my sister sat in a drawer forever. So is that something that is common that people just cannot adapt to their ears, do not adapt to, um, you know? Yes, it is. And, and I would suggest you see an audiologist Yes, and I... you have an you have an audiologist who's willing to work with you. Okay. Um, you know, uh, uh, over the counter hearing aids, a big box. They're going to send them to you, and then it's up to you. Okay. Now that doesn't work for everyone. Um, by the way, in my family, my dad was hard of hearing. My aunt, his sister was hard of hearing. His two brothers were not. My sister has no hearing problems. I do. Okay. You know, but as far as using the hearing aids. I think you just have to realize how far technology That's has right. advanced and ha work with an audiologist who's willing to work with you. It has to be collaborative. Now, I also have chronic vertigo. Can this be an issue also? Yes. Okay. Beyond <laughs> that, it becomes, it becomes a medical thing. And I suggest you see an ENT okay. if you haven't. But the audiologist, you know, if, if you have issues with your ears, vertigo can be part of that. Tinnitus, where you hear these noises, can be part of that. Um, and it's and it's not always the ear. You know, like I have I'm the most common kind of hearing loss, uh, which is called sensorial, where those little hair, ears, hairs in your ear uh, start dying and they, they don't regenerate. But there's all kinds of other reasons people can have hearing loss. So it's it, it becomes a medical question. Okay. And ENT should help you with that. And I also but, have a constant 
noise in my ears, you know. That's the tinnitus. The yeah, ear. it could be running water, it could be drums going on, but it's <laughs> it's always there. That's tin tinnitus, tinnitus, some people call it, I have it. Um, there's a thing, I don't want to go too long here, Lynn, but just quickly, there's a, a whole area called autotoxicity about medicines, even over-the-counter medicines and treatments that could affect your hearing. I was taking a medicine a couple of years ago and I was hearing symphonies, but they were discordant. <laughs> they weren't pleasant symphonies. And I had a new neighbor. I live in a townhouse, lovely young couple, two little kids. <clears throat> so I, and I never, I never heard, I figured, well, it must be coming from next door, right? They were so lovely. I embarrassed myself because it wasn't external. It was being caused from this medicine. I stopped the medicine. I still have time. I still have, you know, uh, th those noises from time to time, but it wasn't seven by 24 anymore. Okay. Wow. Thank you. And what I, what I realized, by the way, with hearing aids is when you have your hearing aids in, it tends to make, it tends to make uh, tinnitus less debilitating because you can hear other things. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, Just, you know, I see that. It probably muffles the other sounds too. I would imagine that it muffles. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, Judy, exactly. thank you again very, very much. I thank appreciate you. Thank your you. generosity of, of knowledge and time. Um, I really appreciate it. And as I mentioned, we are recording this so that this will be available for members who are unable to be here tonight. And um, and we will also be sharing your PowerPoint with all that great information. So again, thank you very much. Have a nice evening, everybody. Thank you. thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate your questions. And when it comes to hearing aids, most audiologists will give you a couple months to try it out. If it doesn't work, you don't need to buy it. Oh, well, that's good to know. That's good to know. Yeah. All right. Thank all you very right. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much.